In this tutorial, we're going to have a look at how we can use 2D arrays to create tile-based landscapes. And what we'll do is extend this idea a little bit later on to create very large 2D tile-based landscapes. So for now, what I want to do is to start out from scratch. And you can see that we have a new solution. It is the PlayStation mobile application, and we'll call this thing Tutorial 12. And make sure that you have Create Directory for Solution checked here. We'll set this project up very similar to how we set up the dual stick shooter. So what I'll do is come here and right click on the project and add a new folder and we'll call this assets. And I already have all of those assets collected right here. There's only two assets we're really going to be working with and we'll put them here into the assets directory of our project. The ones that we have are overworld, which is an MP3 file, which is the background music. And we also have a file here called overworldtiles.png and this is the sprite sheet of the overworld. So I'll copy both of those guys and paste them into assets and then go back up to the project space into shaders and move over my vertex and fragment shader. So I'll copy those and paste them there. And then we'll go back up here to the project space. And if you recall from the inheritance tutorial, we had created this game object class and we're gonna be able to reuse that in this project. So I'll select that as well as sprite.cs and I'll paste them here into the project. So we'll come back over here to the IDE and import all of those things. I'll start by getting the assets. You can see we have overworld and open that. Come over here to shaders and add those files as well. So that's good. And then finally what we'll do is right click on the project and add some files which would be game object and sprite.cs. So we'll open those. Okay, now that the project space is set up, I'd like to go back and look at app main. Now you should recognize this code by now, but if you recall in a previous tutorial, we had created a main game class. And so we're gonna replicate that here again. The responsibility of this main game class is to hold the state of all of the game objects that are in the game. So let's go ahead and create that public class main game. And if you recall, the structure of this was to mirror everything that's going on in app main. So just like we have an initialize and update and render in app main, we're gonna have the same thing here in main game. What I'll do is start by saying public int screen width and also screen height. And we're actually gonna use those this time. Okay, and then we'll stub in these methods here. We'll copy all of the stuff in app main. So I'll say public void initialize. And this is gonna take in that graphics context that we'll just call context. We also need public void update. And this one's going to take in the gamepad data that we'll call gamepad data. And then we also have public void render. Okay, good. So we should be able to call all of these methods inside of main game from app main. And to do that, what I'll say is public static main game. And we'll just create a variable called main game gets a new main game. Okay. And it's app main's responsibility to call all of those methods within main game. So let's go ahead and do that. Here inside of initialize, just after we've created this graphics, what I'll say is main game dot initialize and pass it graphics. Do the same thing down here in update. I'll say main game dot update, passing it the gamepad data. And then finally down here in render, I'll call main games Let's drop over here. I'll call main games render method. All right, so now that we have the basic structure, you can see that any time app main is going to initialize, it's going to call main games initialize. And the same thing is true for update and render. Okay, so let's come up here. Now that we have the basic structure, we probably want to create a tile class. And the reason is because we're creating a tile based landscape. So what I'll do is start by right clicking on the project and adding a new file, an empty class and we'll call it tile. And I'll start by moving all of these using statements over into tile. Okay, now if you recall from the previous tutorial on 2D landscapes, we need a source rectangle and a destination rectangle. And there's really not a rectangle class, but we'll be able to use a vector four and everything's gonna work out. So what I'll do to begin with is to hold on to public int tile type you recall, this could be something like rock or sand or lava or whatever we have. Um, we're also going to need a private vector for source rect. And we'll have to fill in the information on that. 
And then also we'll be able to use that game object class. So watch this. We can say that tile is a game object. And what I'll do is open this up and look at the constructor and copy that and paste it here as the constructor of tile. Now, one additional thing that we'll need for a tile is the tile type. So I'm going to expand the number of parameters that we have for tile and I'll say int tile type. And then on the inside of this, I'll say this dot tile type gets tile type. Now it's going to be really important that we set up that source rectangle correctly. So let's go have a look at that real quick. I'm going to jump in here into assets and then open this up with paint.net. And look at the size of the asset. Now you have to realize that each one of these little tiles is 16 by 16 pixels big. So we're clearly going to have to scale things up. But as I zoom in on this, I've actually got the grid lines on so you can see the individual pixels. These things are 16 by 16 pixels big, but they also have a gray line between them that's one pixel. So we have to account for all of that as well. All right, keep this in mind because we're going to have to come back to this idea of pulling out each individual tile from this texture and then pasting it onto the screen. So I'll go ahead and shut this down for now and come back to the IDE. Okay, now to set up the source rectangle, let's put in a comment here, set up source rectangle. We're going to use that vector four. The first thing that I'll do is to say that source rect gets a new vector four. Now on the inside of source rect, you can see I can type source rect and I have an X, I also have a Y, and I also have a Z, but the next component past that is actually W. And we're gonna use Z and W as a coordinate set just like we used X and Y. So let's go ahead and calculate the offset that we need. And this comes straight from the previous video. So here we go, source rect.x gets tile type mod 18. And then we're gonna multiply that by the tile size. And I'll create this in just a second. Tile size plus one and then plus one. And the reason that we have to have these plus ones here is because we did have that gray border around all of those tiles. Now, how big is a tile size? Let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say public int tile size, and we'll set that to be 16. In fact, we can reuse this for all of the tiles, and I'll just create that as a static variable. Okay, so now that we've created the X position for the source rectangle, let's do the same thing for the Y. Source rect.y gets tile type divided by 18 times the tile size plus one and then that plus one as well okay so if you're a little fuzzy on the math it's important that you go back and look at that video to understand why we're modding and doing integer division here to calculate the source rect x and y okay now we also have to calculate the bottom right coordinate of where we're pulling out our tile from that source texture so to be able to do that we're going to continue on with what we had. Fortunately, we don't have to do as much stuff with mod and integer division. We can leverage what we've already done. So we'll say source rect.z gets, and then we'll say source rect.x plus some kind of offset. In this case, it's going to be the tile size. In other words, the new x position, the bottom right x position, is going to be source rect.x, which you've already calculated, plus 16 pixels wide. We'll do the same thing for source rect.w. And this is going to be the y coordinate of the bottom right uh, part of the source rectangle. So we'll say source rect dot y plus the tile size as well. Oops, tile size. Okay. Um, the last thing that we need to do is to tell the sprite to actually use that. So here what I'll do is I'll say sprite dot set texture coordinates to be, and notice that we have two different ways that we can call this method. We could either pass it two vector twos, or the second way, which we're going to be using, is to pass it four different floats. So in this case, I'll say source rect dot x, source rect dot y, source rect dot z, and source rect dot w. All right, good. Now the source rectangle is set up. We need to work on the destination, destination rectangle. Okay, now we don't necessarily have to set up the rectangle like we did previously. In fact, all we have to do is worry about the position and the width of this sprite. So here's what I'll say. I'll say sprite.position gets pause. Now we have to be careful because this implies that what's coming into the constructor of tile has already been set up. So we're going to have to be a little bit clever when we're creating these tiles and how we calculate the position. Okay. We'll also come down here and say sprite.width gets the tile size. And we're going to leave it that way. It's, it's actually going to calculate incorrectly to begin with, but I want you to see the result of that. 
And then finally, we could say sprite.height gets tile size as well. OK, so we've essentially scaled up the size of the sprite by 16. Otherwise, it would have drawn the entire texture or scaled it out to be the size of that original texture, which is just way too huge. And it looks like we have an error here. Oh, colon versus semicolon. OK, so that's good. Let's come back here to at main, and we'll go ahead and set up this 2D array of tiles. So at the top of the main game is where I'm going to declare the public tile array. And this is going to be a 2D array of tiles. And notice the notation here. We've used a bracket, comma, bracket, which means two dimensions. And we'll call this one terrain. OK? Now, we need to bring all of these tiles to life. And we have to be a little bit clever when we do so. But before we do that, let's go in here and initialize. And we'll say texture 2D. And we'll call this the terrain text. Gets a new texture 2D. And we'll pass it application slash assets slash and let's see, what was the name of this? I believe it was overworld, yes. Overworld tiles dot PNG. And also pass it false. Okay, realize that this represents the entire overworld tile set, and we're only going to need part of that, but we're still going to pass that off to the tiles. Okay, the next thing that we want to do is to bring terrain to life, because right now it's null. So I'll say terrain gets a new tile array. And we have to be careful here, because I'm going to pass it 10 by 16. Now, you may be saying, hey, this was a 16 by 10. But realize that the first thing that we pass is the number of rows. And the second thing that we pass is the number of columns. So think about what we're trying to build and try to visualize that in your mind, because it's 10 rows by 16 columns. OK? That's also going to have an impact on how we set up our loops. And you're going to see that in just a second. OK, we also need to create a couple of variables of type vector 3. We'll create one called temp pause, gets a new vector 3. And we'll do the same thing here for temp vel, even though we're really not going to be using that. We still need to plug in something. And then we also need to have a nested loop, like you saw in the previous tutorials. We need to be able to traverse and hit every single slot within this 2D array. So watch how I structure this. I'm going to say for int y get 0, so long as y is less than, oops, so long as y is less than 10, y plus plus. And then on the inside of this loop, we're going to create the x loop. So for int x get 0, so long as x is less than 16, x plus plus. And you may be asking why we're setting up our loops this way. Think about how we're filling in the information on the inside of this 2D array. The inner loop is going to execute for every time the outer loop executes. So in other words, we're going to be at row 0, and then we're going to scan across the entire top row, filling in information. And then we're going to drop down to the next row, and then scan across that row as well, and then drop down to the next row, and so on. OK, so on the inside, we need to calculate the position where this tile is going to appear on the screen. So what I'll do is I'll say that temp pause.x gets x times tile dot tile size. OK, so again, that is the information that's located here inside of the tile class. Notice how we're using it here directly from the main game. We'll do the same thing for temp pause dot y. Gets y times the tile size. OK, now we're going to have to change this to account for the difference in scale between the world that we're trying to draw and the actual dimensions of the screen of the Vita. And so we're going to have to stretch things out just a little bit. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. OK, so at this point, we have enough information. Oh, I did it again. Let's fix that. At this point, we have enough information to start to populate this 2D array of terrain. So I'll say terrain of y, comma, x. And I'll explain why it's that way in just a second gets a new tile, and we're going to pass it context, the terrain text, which is the entire sprite sheet. We'll also pass it temp pause, temp vel. We'll pass it this, which is the main game. And then finally, we're going to pass it some kind of value here. Notice it says the terrain type. And in this case, we're just going to pass a 0. And then we'll start to populate it with different things a little bit later. Okay. So now that we've populated this, we need to be able to render it. Notice that I can kind of skip over update right now. That doesn't make sense to update the background. Um, all right, so let's jump in here. Then we'll say the same kind of thing for int, for int y get 0, so long as y is less than 10, y plus plus. And then we'll have the for loop for the int, x gets 0. So long as x is less than 16, x plus plus. 
And here's the nice part. I can just say terrain of y comma x dot render. Okay. Now again, why are we using this y x notation as opposed to x y? If you look at the way that we defined the 2D array up here in line 18, you can see that we passed it the number of rows and then the number of columns. And so we're matching up with that because remember X really represents the number of columns and Y represents the number of rows. So you have to be a little bit careful with the relationship between what you're passing here and the way that you have your loops set up. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. And it looks like I have an error. Oh, I forgot to call the base constructor. So let's drop down here. And again, remember base is where we're calling the game object constructor. And I'm just going to use this as a pass through passing it text, pause, vel, and main game. Okay, so that should be good. And then when we run it, you can see that we have everything kind of clustered together. And if you recall what I said at the beginning of this, we're always going to have this issue of scale. So essentially what we need to do is to scale up each tile, but also reposition them correctly on the screen. And let's go ahead and dive into that part of the code. So since we already have the tile class open, let's go ahead and fix this part of the code. The real problem lies here on line 32 and 33. You notice that we've calculated the width and the height of this sprite as being the tile size, but that's not necessarily true. So what we'll do is we're gonna scale it by a ratio. Specifically, we're gonna scale it by the ratio of the Vita's width, which is 960 pixels by 255. Now, where did the 255 come from? We have 16 tiles across, each which are 16 big, which is more or less 255. So what I'll do is multiply the tile size by 960.0f divided by 255.0f, okay? And this is the ratio for the width. Now we have a similar ratio for the height. And so in this case, I'll multiply 544.0f divided by 160 using the same kind of logic. Okay, uh, now that's not going to work and it's not going to give us exactly what we're looking for. But if I run it now, you can see that at least the size of the tile is correct, even though their position on the screen is incorrect. So watch what we're going to do. We're going to take this ratio, I'm going to copy that, and let's come back over here to app main because inside app main is where we're calculating the positions. And so in that case, what I can do is just multiply this by that ratio. Come back over here to tile, grab this part of the code, go back over here to app main and do the same kind of thing. And when we run it at this point, you can see that it fills up the screen the way that it should. Okay, now one weird thing, and it's not as apparent here, but you can see that the tiles are a little bit fuzzy, and that's not the way that the original game worked. So watch what we can do. After we create this texture 2D terrain text, we can go old school here. I'll put in a comment. Now this is not as common. It's, it's good if you want to make a classic 80s kind of game. So realize you're not going to be using this a whole lot, but it's still kind of cool. Watch what I can say. Uh, terrain text, and I'm going to set the filter of this. And the filter is going to be how we're generating the tile and how we're rendering this texture. So we're going to choose a different option here. I'm going to say texture filter. There it is. Okay. Texture filter mode dot. And then we have a couple different options here. Uh, the one that we want is nearest. And this is going to give us that really blocky look. So if I run it again, you can see it has this much more jagged, harsh kind of look. And that's the way that the original game was actually rendered. Okay, now one other thing, just so we can get a little bit of variation here, notice that we're always passing the tile type as zero, but watch what we can do. Just to kind of shake things up, we'll say int counter get zero, and then we'll use the counter and pass counter. And then also what I'll do is to say counter plus plus right here. And when I do this, you can see that we get some variation here, but it looks like our 2D terrain is at least set in the world. So that's it for now. Hopefully you can see that we can use 2D arrays in meaningful ways in our games.